Welcome, and thanks for tuning in to our recording of the Unpack the Kit webinar. It's so great that we can connect in this way and use this format for our education sessions, as geography is no longer a barrier to connect, which is great. As we did in our live webinar, we will be going through the Sexual Health and Relationships Kit today. If you don't have a hard copy of the kit, um, let us know and we can uh, mail one out to you or get one to you, or jump on our landing page on our website and you'll be able to um, get an electronic copy of the kit. I will have some guests joining me for today's session, but first I think it's so important that we start by acknowledging country. And I would just like to slow it down for a minute and take a moment to read out an acknowledgement that we wrote. I would like to acknowledge and pay respects to the traditional owners of the land that which we meet. Today, where we're standing right now, that's the Wadi Wadi people of the Dharawal Nation. It is upon their ancestral lands that we meet. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where we are all sitting today. And as we share our knowledge, teaching and our learning in this space today, may we also pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. I would like to pay my respects to the elders past and present, and I would like to extend my respect to any Aboriginal person who is present in this webinar today. So a little bit about us. We are a health promotion team, which is part of the HIV and related programs unit in the Illawarra and Shoalhaven local health district, and that's part of New South Wales. Uh, we are often called the Caddyshack Project when we're out and about, so um, if you're confused about who that is, that's us. <laughs> and our team is made up of four seriously awesome people. Um, we're a small team with a really big reach, and we promote uh, a positive approach to sex, sexuality, and sexual health. We also aim to reduce the incidence of HIV, STIs, and hepatitis in the four local government areas within the Illawarra Shoalhaven. And of course, we are guided by national, state and local health district strategies. So our HARP team leader, Jen, will be in our chat box for today's session, posting um, hyperlinks and handy um, pieces of information that you might uh, be interested in following up. So our first guest today, is Sophia from the Multicultural Health Service. And she's a close friend of the HARP unit and it's fantastic to have her on board in today's webinar, but also across the whole development of the kit. It's been really great to have her on board. So I'm going to pass over to Sophia, who's gonna provide a little bit of social context for today's session. Thanks, Sophia. Um, thanks, Marty. Thank you for the opportunity to come and present today or have a conversation with all of you. I um, also would like to acknowledge the traditional um, owners of the land. I would also like to acknowledge the Darawal people, um, the people that might be watching this webinar today. And like Mari has said, it is really important for us to really think about now um, that we don't really have boundaries in terms of accessing um, information. So this is a really good medium for us to, to start a conversation. Um, I also like to say thank you to the HARP team for inviting me to present today. And I guess today for us, I really invite you to think about who um, in your service is actually missing. Um, although I work for the multicultural health team, um, we've also had diversity within the multicultural health context. So as you know, New South Wales um, is a very multicultural um, society. We've got over 7 million people living in New South Wales, of which 27 27% are either from a non-English speaking background or were people who were born overseas. So um, when we really think about your services and think about the context in which um, we uh, deliver services, um, we need to think about those groups that are actually missing in, in our services. Um, so if we deliver services um, in the disability space, we need to think about, um, you know, um, who are they in terms of this sexual um, reproductive health, who are they in terms of their sexual um, and well-being. And so this kit, I am very pleased to be part of it because when it was first um, initiated or developed, uh, 
young refugee people were actually involved in the development of it. So they have provided a lot of insight in terms of how inclusive the resource needed to be and in credit to the HARP team, they have actually listened to those. So, um, so going back to New South Wales, so when we think about the 20% of people um, that were born overseas, um, people come in because they, they, they migrate to the, to the stage, they migrate to the region, they, um, they come in because of a sponsor visas, they come in as part of a migration visa, so they got employment under um, different types of visas. We've also got people from refugee or the humanitarian um, asylum background, so the multicultural health team has got a refugee health team. This refugee health team are in charge of actually uh, providing home visits to support the settlement for this region of the refugees and people that are settling in across the lower and the shell heaven. So for this region, we've got a very particular group, which are the women at risk, and they often are recognized as the 204s. Um, these women are often um, uh, alone uh, or come with the children because they lost their spouses or perhaps because they identify as part of the LGBTQI. Now, this is another group that we really, really, we really need to think about. So this group, um, people who uh, have got a, um, a refugee experience, they identify as being a member of a social group. And so the sexual orientation of being a member of the LGBTQI means that they've actually been persecuted because of the sexual orientation. So please think about those groups that are actually missing in your, in your groups. I'd also really like to um, just have a moment to really reflect and given the fact that now, given the current climate, I'd like to read a quote from a very strong um, activist. She's a strong Afro-American um, activist. She's also a woman who identifies as part of the LGBTQI and she goes like this. It is not our differences that divide us. It is our inability to recognize, accept, and celebrate those differences. Her name is Audrey Lord, and I really encourage you to, to look at her poetry and to really look at um, her work uh, because she really talks about that, the people that are missing, the people that are diverse, the context of diversity within those subgroups. Um, now, the um, other element I really want to talk about is how do we actually support the development of your, um, your cultural responsiveness? How can you be adaptable to the different social realities or cultural needs that people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, people from LGBTQI, people from the, with disabilities come into your service? So um, when I say the missing, and I'm not trying to say that they're not going to be found, I really like you to provide services to be able to respond to those groups. I really want you and invite you to be able to adapt your service provision to the context of the cultural reality, yeah? So we've got a definition about what cultural responsive practice is, and it's really the capacity for you to adapt to the different social and cultural circumstances of the people that are actually are coming to your service. There are a number of resources to do that, and one of those is to really start to think about why is it that people from these particular diverse groups are not coming to my service? And really question why um, and what can I do to be able to do that? So one of those is to maybe I'll invite you to find the cultural atlas from SBS. And that um, atlas has put on a range of information around particular groups. And those groups, um, I'm sorry, the actual atlas will be able to give you information around um, the nuances of particular groups. So it comes from a refugee context up to the established communities, the established communities in the Illawarra and, and across the other regions as well. Um, there's another really good resource, which is the Center for Health and Ethnicity, and it provides an array of services that you and resources that you might be able to. Um, to find or download um, to build your cultural capacity. So I guess for me, this is an invitation for you to think about using this kit as a tool of engagement, as a way in which you can actually start a very sensitive conversation with those people who hoping by the end of this session, you're gonna start being culturally curious and say, they won't be missing in my service. I'd like to provide some of those services. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Mari, and I hope that today is a very successful day. And um, I'm more than happy to be available to answer any questions, but for now, thank you so much. Thanks for your time. Thanks so much, Sophia. It was so fantastic having her on board with us 
today. And I guess it's, you know, such a great thing that we can partner on these projects together and learn from each other. So that's fantastic. Okay, we're going to move on now to be talking a little bit more about the kit and a bit more about the background of the kit. And this slide was a really um, great slide for me to develop because I could see over time the journey of, of what this project has looked like. And it all started with um, a research project in 2018 where we recruited 28 international students to participate in qualitative interviews. And these interviews identified the need for um, reliable and accessible sexual health information. And international students acknowledged the importance of a resource being available at a university as a trusted source of information. And this data was used in designing the kit as a resource. We know that international students are an increasing population in Australian universities today. And we also know that diverse cultural backgrounds and life experiences impact international students' um, knowledge and understanding of sexual health, healthy relationships um, and safe sex practices in comparison to domestic students. So the concept then was put together um, by the, with the help of 30 graphic design students. So we commissioned 30 graphic design students uh, with some information about the research and they developed two concepts which were then um, focus tested by third year public health students. So um, it just shows our partnership with the university in this project as well. Um, the focus testing came up with the same thoughts as us that the two concepts needed to be combined. We liked elements from both um, graphic design teams and we felt that they needed to be combined. And to do this, um, we worked with graphic designer Cal Harmer. So Cal and I um, got together and we designed the kit that you see today. So the content and information of the kit was developed by the HARP team, um, which is the four, four of us that I mentioned earlier. And this was reviewed by the Sexual Health Clinic. And of course, making sure that we're aligning with statewide messages through PlaySafe, um, the PlaySafe website. So this kit was distributed to a thousand international students at University of Wollongong as part of a pilot. And we then evaluated this through um, three focus groups with 13 international students. And the information that we got from these focus groups informed the edits and a reprint of the second phase of the project. So the international students were from a variety of backgrounds and they expressed their appreciation of the development of the kit and the importance of the equal distribution to all international students. So the feedback from these focus groups really um, informed in terms of elements of design um, and additional information for inclusion and provided information and suggestions for accessibility, including having an online option. And so that's why we've included um, a QR code into this kit that then links international students back um, to trusted websites. Content, information, design, colour, shape were all discussed and these aspects were considered um, in the further development of the kit. If you would like a, a copy of the evaluation report, just send us an email, get in touch and we'll be able to send that through to you. So that brings us to 2020. Um, after making some of these edits, 5,000 kits were distributed to international students and domestic students at the University of Wollongong. We also began developing an online training tool, which is what we're going to be talking about today. And we started um, some education sessions with international students using the kit as the training tool. So we're going to go through some of the activities that we um, felt were really successful later in today's session. So phase two of the evaluation is currently underway and involves an anonymous survey. So hopefully we'll have um, a second report to be able to distribute um, after this session as well. So now we know the background of the kit. I guess you can 
work out what the purpose is, but the purpose is to develop, the purpose of this project is to develop a resource to increase opportunities for international students to access accurate and reliable sexual health information, including healthy relationships, safe sex practices and STIs. This has expanded beyond international students to include young people, uh, young refugee people, um, other culturally diverse communities. And of course, the kit is not tailored to a university student. It is broad and it has been used in young multicultural women's groups in the Illawarra and has had um, success in those groups as well. So the kit itself is passport shaped. Here it is here. I'll just make sure I can show you. So the kit is passport shaped about the same size as my hand. The outside of the kit has Instagram tiles of young, happy, diverse um, people from culturally diverse communities, from um, other communities. So it's really great visually and the colors had really good feedback from international students. The outside of the kit has no words, titles or logos. And this is on purpose as international students felt that they would pick up the kit more if it had no words on the outside as it's discreet, yet it's engaging and on trend, their words. So that's um, some great feedback that we got in those evaluation sessions. When you open the kit, the words in the titles here explain what the kit is about. And at the bottom, as I said, they have referral links and a QR code which takes, internet, or takes whoever's looking at the kit to an online version of the kit and for more information. And again, that's what the feedback from the evaluation was requesting. So we added that in there and we also added a pride flag in there for further um, inclusivity in phase two. So when you open the kit, if you have it with you, you might wanna open it with me now. So the kit has a female condom in there and this actually inspired the size of the kit. As you can see here, it's around the same size as a female or internal condom is what we um, usually would refer to it as. So it has an internal condom. It also has an external condom or a male condom and that's a PlaySafe branded condom and that's included in the kit as well. The kit has two information sets of information cards. One of them is on sex and relationships and that has stuff around consent, what is an unhealthy relationship, stuff like that. And the other one is around safe and healthy sex and they spin from the corner. This one has things in there about STIs, contraception, protection, things like that. We also have in here, or there's a play safe condom that I was looking for. We also have in here a business card for Bupa, which is the overseas um, health cover, the private health for international students at Wollongong. And the back side of that is information on UOW support services. And the kit also has three of our business cards. They're all the same. And the idea around this actually came from our focus groups with international students. And it's that you hold on to one and then you give to, to other people that you might know. And it's that pay it forward model that we were talking about with international students and that's something that they um, requested. They felt that they wanted to pass information on to their friends and peers. The sets of cards also have added referral links for more inf information and frequently asked questions. And these two in, um, elements were identified as um, strengths for international students. So now we know the background of the kit and what it actually is, we're going to head into um, how we can use the kit to work with the groups that we work with. And there's a few ways that we can do this. The first one I would suggest is to just have it on hand, have it with you, have it in your, at your desk, have it in your bag, have it available for when a young person or client approaches you with a question, have it with you for when you're doing sessions, if it's about women's health, if it's about relationships, just have it with you. And if you don't know the answer, you can go through the kit together to find out. This will help you feel confident and also for um, the people, the young people that you're working with to feel confident that the information that you are providing is accurate and reliable. 
So when you're using the kit as a tool to run education sessions, the biggest tip I can give you is to pitch the education session as a feedback session. So this is a new resource. Um, so your participants are encouraged to provide feedback um, and informally review the kit. And this is where they'll really pick up parts of the kit that they thought maybe they already knew. And, um, and you never really know where, where that information is going to, to lead to. So when facilitating sessions, this activity is really great for a group who may not be engaged in a conversation around these topics and may not want to ask questions. It's the find the information race you can see on the screen. So from my experience, I had participants with medical backgrounds, so they were pretty confident that they knew everything they needed to know around sexual health. And they told me that they would therefore not pick the kid up or use the kit in the first place. And this was a really big issue for me because um, that same medical student told me that the best way to protect yourself from SDRs is to be clean and have a shower before and after sexual intercourse. Now, we know that being clean is great, uh, but it does not protect against STIs and condoms are the best way to protect against STIs. So this really got us thinking, how would we educate someone who is so confident that they know everything they need to know around sexual health? And this is where pitching the education session as a feedback session is really helpful. Uh, introducing the session maybe by saying, I have a, a new resource, a New South Wales Health, I'm uh, wanting some feedback on content, shape, design, colour, and going through each of those elements, you can then use the information race to find out, um, for students to find out what information they know and what information might be a myth. So it's a, it's a good way of doing some myth busting as well. So we've added some more frequently asked questions um, in this kit and that actually inspired this activity. So to play this activity, to, to run this activity, make sure that all participants have access to a kit. Hard copy is best, but you can use the electronic copy as well. Ask a sexual health, reproductive health or healthy relationships question where the answer is found in the kit. So I've put some examples on the slide that you can see now. So participants will then look through the kit to find the answer and give some time for this. We felt, um, don't feel like you're dragging it out. You really do need some time to look through the information cards to find the kit. They are double-sided, so you can um, maybe give a clue around the card number um, for where the answer they need to find. And then whoever finds the answer can read it out and they win. So it's up to you what they win for when we've done our online sessions, they just win nothing. So <laughs> they get to win um, the, you know, the game. So that's really great. Uh, but you can target these questions based on the aims and messages of your session. So if your session is around um, relationships and consent, use these um, sex and relationships cards to build this game for yourself. And this will really prompt curiosity and conversation in a, in a casual setting. So the Who Am I game that we have here is very similar to the previous game, trying to find information, but it's framed a little bit differently. You may have seen this one um, pop up in other trainings that you've been to. Um, basically what you do is make sure the kit uh, the participants have a copy of the kit, ask a who am I or what am I a question where obviously the answer is in the kit would be ideal. And you can give um, clues about which sets of cards it is or um, what card number it might be on. The one on the screen that you can see now, um, the answer to that one, if you haven't got it already, is gonorrhea. So it's a really great, um, I guess conversation starter where you can talk a lot more about STIs and engage in more of a conversation around that. So um, another really great activity to run. So I talked about frequently asked questions earlier um, and I think it's really important. I think you can do a lot of myth busting um, with some frequently asked questions. An activity um, like this can be done in combined with PlaySafe. 
um, nurse nanny. So if you have the capabilities of having two screens um, or a split screen system, you can have the PlaySafe website up on one side and um, some other frequently asked questions up on the other side and that would work really well. So if you aren't already aware, the PlaySafe website is a sex positive New South Wales government website and that's aimed at young people aged 16 to 29 years old for everything they need to know for a confident and healthy sex life. So this can be a really interactive tool with young people. Um, if you're using that split screen system with the PlaySafe website open live in your education session, uh, there's lots of interactive things on that website, like a could I have an STI quiz, a map with the nearest place to get tested, frequently asked questions in a forum space, as well as a nurse on hand, a qualified sexual nurse, health nurse on hand called Nurse Nettie, and they respond to any questions you or your um, participants might have. So this is a fantastic resource for when you might be unsure of the answer, and you can use Nurse Nettie together. So in your session, going through the frequently asked questions can be a good way, um, as I said before, of, of working out what information you might think you know and what information you um, may not already know. So you can do a bit of true or false with these questions. And it's actually a really good way to lead into a question box activity. So um, just consider that one as well around frequently asked questions. So the kit, as I said before, comes with both an internal and external condom. And I think it's a really great opportunity when you're delivering your education sessions uh, to do a condom demonstration. We have a banana penis and an O-cube for these demonstrations and a link will come up in your chat box of where you can access uh, the banana penis and O-cube from. You could, if you don't want to purchase a, a banana penis or an O-cube, you can also um, be creative. I've seen um, condom demonstrations where people have used their finger and that works really well as well. Um, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Naomi from the HARP team, who's going to demonstrate both the internal and external condoms. So just keep in mind that you can use the kit along with the demonstration. The kit has a step-by-step -step guide in there for both the internal and external. So I'll pass over to Naomi. Thanks, Naomi. Wonderful. Thanks, Maddie. And hi, everyone on board. We're filming this live on Tuesday, the 16th of June, and we are in the middle of Refugee Health Week. So I think it is really important for us to be talking about these sexual health resources and how we can open up and have conversations with communities where sometimes sexual health can be a little bit taboo. So well done on the resource, Maddie, and thanks for tuning in and showing an interest on how you may also be able to use this resource with the people people who you are working with. So I am now going to go through and do a demonstration for you of both a male or external condom and a female or internal condom. So with condom use, it's really important that the first thing we get when engaging in any type of sexual behaviour or sexual activity is consent from our partner. Consent and having those sexual relationships is about two consenting partners coming together and for a long time we have worked around this concept of no means no when indeed it does if somebody says no that they're not interested we should be leaving it at that and not forcing pressuring or coercing anybody into doing anything that they feel uncomfortable doing the trouble with the no means no message is though that there are a lot of ways an individual can mean no without actually saying no and body language is a perfect example of that if somebody, for instance, is in a sexual situation and they're curled up in the corner like this, they might be saying yes, but their body language is very much indicating a strong no. So instead, when we're talking about consent, we're talking about moving towards a yes means yes. What are some questions that you might be able to ask your sexual partner that are going to give you yes answers and therefore you know that you have their consent? So for example, do you feel comfortable? Do you feel safe? Would you like me to proceed with this behaviour? And if you're checking in and getting yes answers, you're getting somebody's consent. It's also a very respectful way to open that conversation around consent with your partner. 
risk. So before we even think about condom use, we want to make sure that we're getting that sexual consent from our sexual partner. Once we have that consent, and whilst we have it at the beginning of this demonstration, you can actually check in with your partner and get consent multiple times throughout. It's not just at the beginning. We want to be checking in at multiple times. So condoms are considered a medical product. Therefore, they do have an expiry date on them. You can see in the demonstration there, it is actually a fairly small uh, number on every packet. Uh, from manufacture, most condoms do have a shelf life of about five years. These particular condoms are made out of a latex rubber though, so they can perish or disintegrate quite easily if they haven't been stored correctly. So even though a condom may be in date, you do need to check it when you open it because it may have deteriorated from being kept, for example, in a pocket. Um, if you store it in your wallet and then the wallet goes into the pocket, that can cause friction, which might lead to the deterioration, or if it's been stored in a hot place. So some people may choose to keep them in somewhere like the glove box of their car. That's going to get very hot, particularly in summer and can again um, disintegrate that latex um, rubber. So we need to make sure that we're checking that expiry date. Once we've checked that expiry date and we know that it is okay, uh, we need to open the packet carefully. So we suggest pushing the condom towards the middle of the packet. Each um, condom has two serrated edges. Pull down on one of those serrated edges and the condom will pop out. At this stage, we need to be careful not to ruin the condom's integrity. So women or um, people who have quite long nails need to be careful when opening the condom packet. And we also don't want to open it with our teeth at this stage because we do risk damaging it or putting a hole in it whilst opening. So once it's open, the condom will come out of the packet. We need to remove the condom from the packet. Once it's been removed, we need to check that the condom is around the right way before we unroll it then onto either the sex toy or onto the penis. As you can see from the photo there, the knob usually points up. We like to say it looks like a cute little Mexican hat. If for some reason you haven't um, checked it or you have got it around the wrong way and you've put it onto the tip of um, the penis, you need to make sure that if it's not going to unroll correctly that you then dispose of that condom. An erect penis will quite often have pre-cum at the tip of the penis, which can contain sperm, which could then lead to an unplanned pregnancy. And it may also contain uh, the bacteria or virus that can lead to a sexually transmitted infection. So if you have got it around the wrong way, please dispose of it and get another condom. It's a really good reason to carry multiple condoms um, around with you just in case a mistake like that is made. So once we've got it around the right way, we need to squeeze the tip of the condom to remove any air that is in there. We like to say we need to give somewhere for the little swimmers to go. If that air wasn't expelled from that condom and then it was placed onto the penis, you might get an air bubble, which is more likely than going to lead to a condom breakage, therefore making the condom less effective in terms of preventing an unplanned pregnancy or sexually transmitted infection. It also may cause the sperm um, or the semen to come back out the end of the condom, which again is not good in terms of protection. So really important to squeeze the tip and remove that air bubble. Once that is done, while holding onto the tip, we then place the condom onto the head of the penis or the toy, and we wanna ensure that it is then being slid all the way down. The reason why it's important to make sure it is um, placed onto the entire length of the penis or the toy is that we don't want it to fall off. Um, if we only roll it to halfway, there is a chance that that could come off during the sexual act. Uh, we also want to offer as much protection from our skin to skin viral type infections such as genital herpes or genital warts. In rolling it all the way down, we're offering greater protection against those two things as well. Once that condom is applied, we do recommend the additional use of a water-based lubricant. All condoms that are sold in Australia do come pre-lubricated, but we recommend the additional use of that water-based lubricant. Lubricant can make it a more pleasurable sensation for both parties during intercourse. We just need to make sure that that lubricant is a water-based. We don't want to use any oil-based lubricants um, or food-based lubricants such as Vaseline or honey etc. Making sure it is water-based. 
Once that happens, sexy time occurs. That might either look like vaginal sex, anal sex, or oral sex. And during that time, ejaculation may occur. Once that has happened, we would like to remove the penis or the toy from whichever orifice or whichever um, passage it has been in. So we say to hold the base of the condom while withdrawing. The reason why that is important is that we don't want the condom, sorry, we don't want the penis to come one way and the condom to go the other. Sometimes people have presented themselves to emergency departments with condoms um, in their vaginas or anuses that have come off during intercourse. So hold the base and withdraw. Once we remove the condom, we tie a knot in it. And the reason why we do that is to stop any of those sexual fluids from coming out of that condom. If we were to get any of those sexual fluids on our fingers or hands during this time and then touch ourselves or touch our partners in the genital area, there is still a chance that a sexually transmissible infection could be passed from one person to another. So tie a knot in it to trap those sexual fluids in. Once we've done that, we just recommend putting it into the bin. Usually with the packet that it has come out of, you quite often have a tissue or something nearby that you might be able to wrap it in and just dispose of it in the bin. We don't want to put it anywhere else. We don't want to flush it down the toilet, for example. It can be really embarrassing uh, for a plumber to have to come to your house and unclog the toilet because multiple condoms have been flushed down there. You also don't want to just litter and put it on the ground. Um, particularly here where we are in the Illawarra and Shellhaven, we're in a beautiful coastal area. So we don't want those condoms to get washed down the drain and then end up out in the ocean. Turtles think they're food quite often and that's not cool. So please do the right thing and yeah, place them into the bin after, after use. So that was the male or external condom. Generally speaking, to buy them from a shop, they will often come in a pack of six to 12, but they equate to about 50 cents each. There are a number of services uh, across all areas in New South Wales that do offer those condoms free of charge. And if you are a service, you can jump onto the PlaySafe website uh, and order 144 free condoms for your service. So a very cheap form of protection against an unplanned pregnancy and or a sexually transmitted infection. So then moving on to the female or internal uh, condom, they are made of a different material to the male condom, but first and foremost, we need to get that sexual consent again. It's having that conversation with your partner that you both feel comfortable to move forward and participate in any sexual act or behaviour that you have discussed, checking in with them and getting that sexual consent throughout this condom process. So once we have consent, again, they are considered a medical product, so they do have an expiry date on the outside of the packet, just the same way that the uh, external condom did. A slightly shorter um, shelf life on these, because as I mentioned, they are made of a nitrile material. They're not made of a latex material. The benefit of this is, is that if you or your partner have a latex allergy, which can be a common allergy, you are then able to use female condoms as an alternative and not have the same irritation or issue that you may have. So we check that expiry date. Similar to the external or male condom, we then need to open this packet carefully. There are two serrated edges and then the condom itself will come out. Again, just being careful if we have long nails and making sure that we're not using our teeth during this process. Once that condom comes out, you can see that there are two rings. There is the inner ring that is squeezed and inserted into the vagina, very similarly to how a tampon would be inserted. The lower outer ring then sits on the outside of the vagina. So we hold the inner ring, we squeeze the edges close together, that is then inserted up into the vagina. Once in place, it will cup the cervix. So we want to insert that as far as possible. That ring will then pop to cup the cervix. And as I mentioned, that outer ring will sit on the outside of the vagina. The internal condom does provide a little bit more protection of that genital area. So it is covering a little bit more of the skin surface area, therefore providing a little bit more protection against those viral infections such as herpes or genital warts. To remove the condom, 
we are going to um, take that outer ring and twist it. We're twisting it to make sure that those sexual fluids are again staying in place and we're going to gently pull it down out of the vagina. Some people ask if there's a chance that the condom will fall out during sex. Remembering that the vagina is a muscle and the same way that a tampon stays in place, the internal condom stays in place too. So twist and then gently pull down and that condom will come out. We wanna make sure again that it's going into the bin, use the packet that it came in to wrap it up, use a tissue, place it in the bin. Again, we're not recommending to flush those down um, any toilets or to litter them and have them end up in our waterways. A little bit more expensive compared to the male or external condom and not as readily available. So whilst you can walk into most shops or pharmacies and pick up an external or male condom to get the female or internal condom, you're most likely going to have to buy it online or get it from a family planning service. We want to make these more popular. This is about empowering women and having a choice around protection. So hopefully the more popular they become, the more readily available they'll become as well. They work out to be about $3 each and they are a single use. So a little bit more expensive than the male or external condom. So that's our condom demonstrations. I hope that that's been useful for a, being able to go through that process with your clients and demonstrate ways to protect themselves against both a possible unplanned pregnancy and or sexually transmitted infection. Well done, Maddie, on the resource. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks so much, Naomi. It's so great to um, hear Naomi do those uh, condom demonstrations. So if you're wanting to do one of those demonstrations yourself, feel free to, to go back through um, today's YouTube video and have a look and see um, and take some tips away from that demonstration. Before we finish up today's session, I thought it'd be really great to share a few handy um, sexual health related websites and services available to you. The first one you've got up there is the PlaySafe Nurse Netty. I talked about that earlier. You'll go to Place for Sexual Health um, and sex, More Sex Information. Uh, the Sexual Health Info Link, I haven't spoken about that yet um, today, but the Sexual Health Info Link is a secure phone line where you can talk to a sexual health nurse. So that might be something that you um, or your participants might be interested in accessing. And as Naomi said, PlaySafe Pro website have um, these PlaySafe branded condoms, as you can see here. And you can actually order a bag of 144 um, free PlaySafe branded condoms per month for your service or organisation. So that's a really fantastic um, resource and I would definitely recommend getting in touch with them. And of course, Paddy Shack Project is us. We are a small team with a really big reach. Uh, this is our landing page just sliding through now so jump onto our landing page for more information around um, sexual health but I promise it's not all about sex. We do um, share some handy um, websites around other stuff as well but you can keep up to date with our fortnightly blog, follow us on social media, subscribe to our monthly e-newsletter or view our um, annual training calendar that might be um, of use to you. And that's the end of today's session. So thanks so much to Sophia from Multicultural Health Service and Naomi from the HARP team who have joined us today. And thanks um, to, Met, to Jen for um, sending all of those links in our chat box. Um, and I wanted to thank the participants who joined our live webinar. It was really great to hear your feedback on the kit and on the session itself. So looking forward to the next one. Thanks so much. Bye.